come to our online worship service for Awake Ministries this Sunday, December 12th, 2020. Before we begin our worship, let us start with a word of prayer. And leading us in prayer this Sunday will be our brother, Yun chung -woo. Let us pray together. Let's pray. Heavenly God, we are here to worship and praise you. No matter how COVID-19 threatens us, you are so merciful and graceful that you led us to participate this glorious time in Awake Ministry. Also, please save and embrace them who are suffering from physical health and all those spiritual wars. Father God, we are not only here for blessings, but also we want to get close to you more and more. And before we get your words, we want to lay down ourselves before you. Help us our hearts tender and soft, and let us away from evil, so make us to be ready to receive your sweet words. We also want to pray for Pastor Joseph Kim. Um, give him your wisdom and working Holy Spirit that he has no lacking to send your words. Please clear our minds to listen, carry, and absorb your precious words. Thank you for your mercy and grace. We pray in your name. Amen. Thank you very much. Uh, for that prayer. And now for a time of worship. Our Tehila worship team uh, has been working hard, uh, even though we are online only once again, to bring you this praise and worship. So let us join our hearts together. <laughs>
for today comes to us from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Hear now the word of the Lord. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip Tetrarch of Eturia and Trachodinus, and Lysanias Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for, for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. The word of the Lord. Before we begin our sermon today, we will have a special praise from our Shoshana Choir pianist, our sister Wudami, will play us a special song. Bye. 
we give thanks truly that we can join together on this Lord's Day. It is a beautiful day as the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And although we cannot come together in person, it is truly by the grace of God that we can join together in spirit. I often think to myself, if this pandemic had happened 10 years ago, or maybe even five years ago, I think it would have been that much more difficult to have online worship. It truly would have been an incredible challenge for us and many other churches, especially the smaller churches. It would have been very difficult to have online worship. It would have been such a challenge for us to share in fellowship, even while remaining socially distant. So from that perspective, I truly give thanks. I thank God that coronavirus happened in 2020 and not 2010 or even 2000. Or imagine if it happened in the year 1990 or 1980. We would have been having worship through the radio. But thank God it happened this year. But of course, let us continue in prayer for all the people, all the businesses affected by this pandemic who have been so negatively affected. And let us pray especially for the coming vaccine. Hallelujah. Let the vaccine come. But whether we are at church or worshiping together at home, the joyfulness of the Advent season cannot be taken away from us. That is something that can never be stolen out of our grasp. We will continue to look forward to the coming, the birth of our Savior, the Messiah. So for today's reading, for this third Sunday of Advent, we will be looking at Luke chapter 3. And in this chapter, this passage, we find John the Baptist at the very beginning of his ministry work, his career. Now, you could read this and say that this is not quite an Advent passage, not in the traditional sense, because it takes place well after Jesus had already been born. In fact, as of this passage, Jesus has been fully grown already as a man and is ready to begin his own ministry. But John quotes from Isaiah 40, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low in preparation for the coming king. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways shall become smooth, and all people will see God's salvation when that time comes. In these verses, we see the holy anticipation that John had in his heart. And this holy anticipation is the very foundation of Advent itself. John was waiting for the Messiah to come. John was waiting for the Messiah to come. Even though Jesus had already been born, John was eagerly expecting the Messiah. Even though John knew Jesus personally already, he knew who Jesus was, and still John was eagerly expecting the coming of his Lord. Let us remember John's mother, Elizabeth, and Jesus' mother, Mary, were actually relatives. They were related. They were family. Some say that they were cousins, although we cannot be completely sure. And indeed, if you look in the Bible, their first recorded interaction between these two mothers comes before either Jesus or John were even born. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby John leapt inside her womb in her stomach, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. Even though Jesus had already been born in Luke chapter 3, even though John was personally familiar with Jesus, John still maintained this heart of Advent, the heart of expectation, anticipation. 
This is a lesson for us this Advent season, is it not? It sounds like an oxymoron, something that cannot exist, to expect something that has already happened. How do you expect something that has happened 2,000 years ago? It already happened. Jesus has already been born. How can we expect Jesus' birth? But we must look forward to Jesus at all times and in all ways. We look forward to his birth. We look forward to his life and his ministry. We look forward to his death and his resurrection. And most importantly, we look forward, we still look forward to his triumphant return. For Jesus will come back to lead his people home. Let us never forget what God has promised, he will most certainly deliver. What God has promised, he will most certainly deliver. And like John, we must never grow so familiar with Jesus. Oh yeah, I know Jesus. We must never grow so familiar with Jesus that we lose that heart of anticipation. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us specifically, but I can imagine John and Jesus as they were growing up as children, playing together, running around. Could you imagine these two young children playing, growing up together? Their, mar- their mothers, Mary and Elizabeth, certainly shared a very close relationship with one another even before they were born, as we saw in Luke 1. And there it says that Mary even stayed at Elizabeth's house for three months while she was pregnant with John. But still, even though he was familiar with Jesus, maybe more so than anyone else, any of his disciples, still, John showed Jesus respect. He honored him as the coming Messiah. So this Advent season, let us expect Jesus. Let us expect him with this same heart of holy fear, holy reverence, respect. Even though we are close to Jesus, even though we are familiar with him, as John was, we must still await him. We must still respect him in this way. You know, there are a lot of great songs that we can sing. We sing that Jesus is our best friend and he will always be and nothing will ever change that. We sing that Jesus is the lover of my soul. He will never let us go. We have all these familiar terms for Jesus, that he is our best friend. But let us always maintain this posture, this attitude towards him of respect, because he is the promised Savior. He is the coming King. John maintained this posture, this attitude of Advent. But I think it's not only John's attitude that we should pay attention to, but also in this passage we see the attitude, the posture of the author himself. Reading from the Gospel of Luke, we know that the author is, trivia question, the author, of course, is Luke, the Gospel of Luke. And Luke begins chapter 3 with what seems like a very boring list of the people in charge at that time. He says, well, Tiberius was the Caesar of the Roman Empire, and under him was Pontius Pilate, ruling as governor over Judea. Herod was placed as the Tetrarch of Galilee. His brother Philip, the Tetrarch of Etheria and Trachonidas to the north. Lysanias was put in power as Tetrarch over Abilene to the east. These were the political and military powers at that time. And Luke goes on to list the religious leadership of the time as well. That is represented by the two high priests, Annas and his son-in-law, Caiaphas. Of course, Caiaphas is the one who presided over Jesus' trial. 
as we read this list of names, it seems like something that we would find in a textbook that we read in history class. It reads like something that we would see in a company directory showing this person and that person and that person. What it is, is an organizational chart. It's an organizational chart. We're very familiar with this in Korea, aren't we? We call it a 조직도, right? An organizational chart. And what this chart does, it shows everyone's place, everyone's order in this world. Who is above who, who is below who. Everyone knows their place. And surely, Luke was not just any author, but he is unique among the Bible authors, especially the gospel authors, as a professionally trained doctor. Luke was a physician. Luke, MD. So you think, well, certainly he would have the kind of attention to detail, to include all these historical facts, right? To make such a list of all those in power. But we have to wonder, did he write down these names simply to record as a matter of historical fact who was in power at that time? Or did he have some deeper message? I want to ask you, have you ever found yourself placed into an organizational chart? Have you ever been put in a position where people were above you, people were under you, and you knew your place in that chart? When I worked at my previous company, I could see the entire organizational chart. And from my recollection, this was around 250,000 employees. That's a lot of people. But in that sea of people, 250,000, I knew my place exactly. I could see the organizational chart showing who was above me and who was below me. And I still remember as I was looking, it would start with me and then it would go to my manager and then my manager's manager. And then that manager had a manager above them and that manager's boss was the CEO of the entire company, all the way at the top, the CEO, the president of our company, Mr. Diamond. What a great name, huh? Mr. Diamond. When you look at a chart like this, when you see your place among 250,000 people and you see your path to get to that top, the peak, it's easy to feel pretty small, pretty inconsequential, like you're not very important, like no one knows who you are. To be placed in such a hierarchy reminds you to know your place. I remember when my class of recruits, we were fresh recruits, uh, new hires, and we were sent to go for training and orientation together at the company headquarters, uh, just one block away from Wall Street. I still remember the building, the streets, the smell. And during my time there, I met a man named Chris. And Chris was from a very wealthy family in Detroit. He liked to remind everyone that he was from a very wealthy family in Detroit. But Chris was special and he remains in my memory to this day because after we got out of training, during the first week that he spent at his new office, he got a great idea. He thought that it would be funny to try and call the CEO of our entire company, Mr. Diamond, to call him with the contact information that was listed on that organizational chart. Remember, I said you can chart your way all the way to the top. So he decided to call this number, Chris, from the wealthy family in Detroit. And he called and the phone rang. And of course, the CEO did not pick up, but his secretary picked up the phone. And I don't think I need to explain when I say that she did not think it was very funny. And 
of course, did not connect his call through to the CEO. But shortly after he had hung up the phone, the phone rang back. But it wasn't his phone. It was Chris's manager's phone that was ringing. His manager picked up the phone, nodded, nodded, wasn't speaking, just nodding, looked at Chris, nodded, nodded. After he hung up the phone, within 10 minutes, Chris was packing up his desk in a box and being escorted out of the building by security. He had been fired on the spot because he needed to know his place. He needed a reminder of who he was and who was above him and above that and above that and even above that. I'm sure he learned a valuable lesson that day, or maybe he didn't. But we know not to mess with the power structures placed around us by the world. We know not to mess around, don't we? There's a very great phrase in Korean that sums it up perfectly. It says, Gaburjima, Gaburjima. When you know your place in the structure, you know not to mess around to be serious, to know your place, and to act accordingly. In Korean, in, in Korea, if you have a superior above you at work, you can't even call them by their name. You know, have you thought about that? You can't call superiors by their names, only by their titles. Even these little things remind you that you should know your place. This is where you are. And this is where all these other people are above you. And things were not any different in the time of Jesus. In fact, you could say that it was even worse. Back in those days, the difference between the very top and the very bottom was even greater than it is today. So when Luke recorded the hierarchy of that time, the hierarchy of the world that he was living in, that Jesus was living in, he listed first the most powerful man in the entire world with an empire that stretched from ocean to ocean all across the map. Then he listed those serving under him in positions of authority and influence and those serving under that. And then he put the religious leaders of the nation under that. But along with those weighty names of Caesar and governor and tetrarch and high priest, he added one more name, John, son of Zechariah. It almost sounds funny, John, son of Zechariah. Who is this guy? To say that John's name did not fit in among that list is a huge understatement. Who is John? Who is Zechariah? that he should be mentioned in the same list along with Caesar, along with Annas and Caiaphas. Who is John? But the truth is, it didn't matter who John was. It did not matter who John was. It mattered what had come to him. It mattered the mission that he had been given because it says the word of God came to John son of Zechariah. That's who he was. The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It was the word of God that gave John power. It was the calling that he had been given by God to preach that gave him importance and meaning. That is the only reason he was included in that list because John was nothing. John was a nobody. He did not matter. But he believed in a God who was somebody. He believed in a God who was something and not just something, but everything and all things. It is true that we must live in these power structures. We must live inside this hierarchy. We know our place in this world. 
We are reminded of them every single day of what our place is. And we must often respect and obey these structures as well. Indeed, Paul tells the early church to submit to the governing authorities, to submit to them because they have been placed in power by God, that they only have authority because it has been allowed to them by God. But still we must know that these structures, these hierarchies, these organizational charts, they do not determine our worth. They do not determine our status. No, they never can. They do not dictate our identity and our calling because those, those can only come from God. Those are God-given. If Caesar was the CEO of that time, the chief executive officer, then John, John was not even the janitor who swept the floors at night. He wasn't even the cleaning guy. He was even below that. Who was John? He was nobody. But because he was given God's word, because he was given a mission by God, a work to do, his name was worthy to be mentioned. His name was worth knowing and worth recording in this Gospel of Luke, in this list. But we know that John was not the point of this story. We know that he is not the main character. He is not the hero that we have been waiting for. John himself spoke of another power structure, another hierarchy that had been put into place. One that was not visible to those who did not have the eyes to see or the ears to hear. We see that because of John's faith, because of his dedication to the mission that God had given him, he gained quite a bit of popularity among the people. They loved John. People embraced John. And they even began to wonder if John was the one that had been promised to deliver Israel. They wonder, is this God's anointed one? Was the star in the sky meant for John? And so later in the chapter we read, the people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. Could it be John? Could this be the one that we've been waiting for all this time? Is our wait finally over? Is it John who has come to rescue us? But what does John say? How does he respond? He does not take the glory for himself, but reflects it all to God. He says, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. And he will baptize you with spirit and fire. Even though John was mentioned along with the heavyweights of this world, in our passage today. He knew that he was nothing. He knew that he was a nobody. In comparison to the one that he was expecting, the coming king, he was nothing. He was a nobody. He could not even tie the shoelaces of Christ, the coming king. John may have been mentioned in this list, in this organizational chart of the rulers of this world, but Jesus was not a part of this list. Jesus was not on the chart because he stood above the chart as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Anointed One of Israel. Our sermon today is entitled, The Hierarchy of History. Caesar and his subordinates are part of that historical hierarchy. But we who have received the gospel know that there is another aspect to history. If you have listened to enough sermons, there is a very popular saying that history is his story. It is the story of Christ. It is the redemption story, the redemption arc, the narrative that goes throughout all of human history as with God as its author. So in the spirit of Advent, we see that this new hierarchy is being established. 
a new hierarchy is being put into place. The hierarchy of his story. It is the hierarchy of his story. As we close, let us consider this, that as we have seen from this passage today, whatever power structure has been placed around you and above you, God's servant, God's word, God's calling is above that. But standing over even all of that with all power and with all authority is God's anointed one. This is who we must expect this Advent season. And as we saw from the example of John, that expectation should not lessen because Jesus has already been born. Neither should it lessen as we grow closer to Jesus in our walk of faith. In anything, that expectation must grow. It should increase over time. For indeed, we are still expecting his final return. And finally, let us recognize that with the coming of Jesus, that the hierarchy of history was forever changed. It was replaced with the hierarchy of his story. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, Father God, we thank you, Lord, that you have allowed us this time of worship, that you have allowed us to come together, O Lord, Father God, even if not in body, in spirit, to join in fellowship, in worshiping and eagerly expecting, anticipating the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, this Advent season. And so we pray together all these things in his holy name. Amen. Just a couple of announcements before we conclude our service with the benediction. Of course, as you know, all our services are online for the time being. Uh, in accordance with the government guidelines, we are now under the 2.5 guidelines. So all church services will be online only until the end of this year. And of course, we will update you uh, as soon as there is any change or extension to this schedule, whatever it may be. Uh, we will update you as soon as possible. And of course, we would all uh, like to gather together once again, but we must do so in a way that is safe, a way that is healthy, and a way that is responsible to ourselves, but also to our community and our neighbors. So let us continue in prayer for our leadership, uh, our church leadership, our nation's leadership, the leadership across the world uh, as they continue to fight this coronavirus pandemic. And let us continue in prayer, as I mentioned before, for all those who are struggling currently. Uh, there are so many people, untold stories uh, of people, families, businesses that have been groaning under the weight of this pandemic. Let us keep them in our prayers. And certainly let us pray, continue in prayer for this coming vaccine, especially as those who will receive it first are those who are most at risk and those who are most essential. Uh, let us pray for their health and safety as they are the first ones to receive this vaccine. And let us also uh, continue in prayer for all of our members who are currently sick, currently ailing. Uh, we have members who are currently in the hospital. We have members whose parents are fighting against the coronavirus itself. Uh, let us continue to keep them in our prayers. We cannot forget them uh, during this time as well. And now let us conclude our today's service as we pray together with the benediction. And we pray together, Lord, now, that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who flipped the power structures of this world upside down, and the love of the Almighty Father God, who sends his word to his people on this earth, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, who keeps the spirit of Advent burning within our hearts, that it will be with the members of our Awake Ministries and Myeongsang Church now and forever. Amen.